ever heard of a church building posting a sign on its doors declaring it's gone out of the religion business? Maybe not, but I guarantee you, you will see lots of those signs one day. Or for those of you familiar with the idiom in the American South, I guarantee you, you will see lots of those signs one day. One day there will be lots of empty buildings regarded as obsolete relics of a time that failed to fully embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ. One day the gospel of Jesus Christ will fully put institutionalized big business religion out of business. The gospel of Jesus Christ will declare religion to be as dead and as obsolete as the dodo bird. Actually, the gospel has already made that declaration. And Christless religion is already dead. It has no spiritual life or vitality. When contrasted with the dynamic grace of God, Christless religion is sterile, as dead as the religious idols and icons to which hundreds of millions of people pray. Hi, I'm Greg Albrecht, and this is CWR, Christianity Without the Religion. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for allowing us to be of service by pointing you toward Jesus. For indeed, we do not preach of ourselves. We do not point you to who we are. We point you to Jesus. Our message today, based on Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 14, is titled, Jesus, the End of Religion. But before we begin talking about and reading from the book of Hebrews, let's join together wherever we may be around this world in prayer. Dear God, no matter how hard we try, no matter how we might be convinced that we can do enough to please and appease you, We're incapable of doing so. Christless religion, with all of its programs and ceremonies, its dogmas and doctrines, its beliefs and practices, seduces and deceives us in such a way that we can engage in endless posturing and pretenses in vain attempts to persuade you to love us. Teach us today, as we focus on Jesus in the 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews, about the central role that Jesus plays in giving us eternal, unconditional relationship with you through his righteousness that you so freely give to us by your grace. This we pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 14. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 14. You may know the book of Hebrews to be a book that is written to, stay with me now, the Hebrews. That is, Jewish Christians who were struggling with their faith and would continue to struggle with their faith, particularly as the author had in mind the coming destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, the place where God was thought to live, the place which was the center of the old covenant religion. And so the author of the book of Hebrews is preparing these New Testament Jewish Christians, helping them across the bridge from their Jewishness in terms of religion to 
full-blown, unadulterated, Christ-centered faith. That's what the book of Hebrews does, and it continues throughout the book to contrast Jesus with the Old Covenant. And here in Hebrews chapter 10, we continue that theme. In this particular place, we're talking about the high priesthood, the priesthood and the sacrifices of the Old Covenant contrasted with Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 14. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming. And Paul is not specifically talking about any law, like a 25-mile-an-hour zone in a neighborhood or a stop sign or the law that you can't drink alcoholic beverages if you're under uh, 21. No, no, no. He's talking about the law, specifically the Old Covenant law. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming. The law is not the reality itself. For this reason, it, that is the law, can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. And of course, we're thinking of all the old covenant sacrifices and the sacrifices of bulls and goats and various birds and all kinds of other sacrifices that were given. And we can easily think, oh, well, those people were really ancient and and we don't do that today. Well, no, I mean, we're talking about all kinds of sacrifices here. Now, specifically, Paul is talking about old covenant sacrifices, but we're talking about the sacrifices that religion today. So, well, you've got to sacrifice and make sure you've got to go to church every week. If you've got to sacrifice, make sure you pray one hour a day. No, there's all kinds of sacrifices that could be included within the tenor of what we're talking about. For this reason, the law can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, I don't care what sacrifices they are, whether you're going around the rosary or you're sacrificing a bull, it doesn't make any difference. Sacrifices cannot make perfect those who draw near to worship. Verse 2. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? <laughs> it's a good point. In other words, what's the point? If sacrifices can make you perfect, then what's the point? Sooner or later, they will, and then you don't have to continue to do them. For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me with burnt offerings and sin offerings. You were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come, that is Jesus, the Son of God, God in the flesh, to do your will, my God. First he said, verse 8, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them. Though they were offered in accordance with the law, that is the old covenant law, then he said, here I am, I've come to do your will. He sets aside the first, the first what? The first covenant, the first testament to establish the second. The second what? The second covenant. He doesn't combine them. He sets aside the first and establishes the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands. Now we're talking about, let's talk about the old covenant sacrifices and the priesthood. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Read this again. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Verse 12, but when this priest, Jesus, our high priest, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, we're talking about his cross, he sat down at the right hand of God. He didn't stand. He sat down, and since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. 
In the Old Testament nation of Israel, priests continually offered sacrifices. In order to be in right relationship with God, the people needed to continually offer sacrifices. But the primary lesson of the animal sacrifices of the Old Covenant was, as we read a few chapters earlier in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, as a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. In fact, verse 1 of Hebrews 10, our passage today, continues that. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming. The sacrifices, with all of the Old Covenant law, were but a copy and shadow of Jesus, who is the end of the law, for that matter, the end of religion as a way of relating to God. The temple sacrifices were simply an earthly picture, a depiction of the reality given to us in and through the birth and death of Jesus, God in the flesh. The entire sacrificial system was an intrinsic part of the Old Covenant. God designed and ordered it to be an illustration of the futility of human attempts to please and appease God through their performance. Let's read Hebrews 10, verse 11. Again, I've already read it, I think, a couple of times. Let's repeat it one more time. Day after day, we're reading now of the futility and the emptiness of religious ritualism, not just of the Old Covenant, but any religious ritualism. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. The priests of Old Covenant Israel stood and performed day after day, again and again, offering the same sacrifices which could never take away sin, offering the same sacrifices day after day, bustling around in a hurry to get somewhere while going nowhere, working hard while accomplishing nothing, a futile endeavor. God designed it for that purpose. It was a shadow. It was to teach us something. God designed futility and emptiness into the heart and soul of the Old Covenant to demonstrate to us that religious priests, potions, pills, prescriptions, and programs have no power. And beyond that, they're an exercise in futility. You've heard the old saying, or perhaps I should say a definition. Insanity is the act of doing the same thing over and over again, hoping that one day you'll see a different result or conclusion. You know, we human beings are spiritually insane. Jesus Christ came to deliver us from the kingdom of religious loony bins where we endlessly hustle around thinking that somehow, some way, this time all of our hard work and performance will positively influence God and he will smile benignly on us and usher to us that we can come into his heavenly kingdom. According to the new covenant in Christ. That's what religion is all about. Futility and emptiness. About a, It's a handful of spiritual wind. The old covenant, with all of its assignments, its stipulations, its rituals, its sacrifices, its, its endless work to be performed, was as that old comedy, and I mean old, by William Shakespeare announces, much ado about nothing. The high priests of Old Covenant Israel and all of the high priests, bishops, pastors, reverends, and religious muckety-mucks then and now are continually running around doing and doing and doing, alarming and frightening and scaring the hell out of their followers, screaming and yelling and condemning, all in an effort to make their followers do the right things. It was a much ado about nothing. I mentioned earlier in our message that one day Jesus will declare religion, in fact he already has, but then it will be finally sealed and a fait accompli that religion will be as dead as the dodo bird. The dodo bird is spelled, by the way, D-O-D-O. -D -O. Do, do, do. That's what religion is all about. It's one gigantic, great big dodo bird. And by the way, continuing the analogy, not to be rude or crude, but it's leaving little piles 
of stuff all over the world. Religion. The dodo bird. By contrast, what does Jesus, our high priest, the mediator of the new covenant, what does he do? Let's read Hebrews 10, 12 again. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. He's not hustling around. He's not worried. He's not harassing us. He's not bustling around thinking, oh, I've got to get all this done because I don't know if we're going to make it and I don't know if all these people are going to be raptured or all they're going to be in the kingdom or I've got a lot of work to do. Jesus sits. He rests. The work is over. All that is necessary has been done. And what is it exactly that he invites us to do as his followers? You know, don't you? Rest in him. Is that the message you get from big business religion? To rest? Now, don't get me wrong. This is not to say that Christianity, authentic Christianity, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, being a Christ follower, is a cakewalk of ease and that we can just behave any old way we want to in self-serving, immoral, or licentious ways. Christ-centered Christianity means that we accept Christ. We accept the gracious offer of God to live by his grace rather than by our religious performance. We trust him. We rest in him. We know that he's done everything that needs to be done rather than endlessly being worried as we scurry around, bustling around like some priest offering sacrifices day after day, trying to get everything done, trying to make the grade. As Christ followers, we willingly follow Jesus, which entails, among other things, picking up our individual cross and following him. And that entails sacrifice, service, and suffering. For indeed, that's the life he lived. It's not a life of ease by any means. But in doing so, we are given the absolute faith and confidence that we know that we may rest in Christ. We know that we are in him and he is in us because we know that nothing we do or nothing whatsoever endears us to God in such a way that he would love us more than we would have. When we follow Christ, we're not endlessly and forever tormented, worrying about being good enough. We rest in him knowing that nothing we can do, no religious efforts or programs will ever be good enough, but that Jesus is good enough, and therefore, by God's grace, so are we. The cross of Christ signals the end of religion. The cross of Christ brings human efforts to, quote-unquote, get right with God to an end. The cross of Christ, to use a phrase popularized by an author named Robert Capon, posts a closed, out-of-the-religion-business sign on the doors of institutionalized, legalized religion. Christless religion in Christendom has lost its way. It's forgotten Jesus. It uses his name but denies his power. Back in 1968, a Christian youth movement named the University Christian Movement voted itself out of existence. They had the courage to realize they'd lost their way, so they closed their doors And one of the young people who'd been involved with this Christian movement posted this sign on the door of their now-closed New York office. Gone out of business, didn't know what our business was. Sadly, many churches and denominations today, friends, no longer realize what their business is. They act like their business is the destruction of sin. They behave as if they are sin exterminators trying to manage the sin of their followers so that their followers will become, as a result of all their actions and the teachings of the religious sin exterminators, better, more moral people. I know about that approach to God. I tried it for almost four decades before God mercifully, by his grace, helped me see how bankrupt and empty Christless religion is. Many of you have had similar experiences. By God's grace, I know that prayer is not a bargaining session with God where we try to make a deal that we will make him happy and then he'll give us what we want. By God's grace, I know that the manner in which I am baptized, and I've been baptized twice, by the way, so that makes me better than you, doesn't it? Just joking. I know that the manner in which I'm baptized 
the frequency I take communion or the Lord's Supper, how long I pray or the specific words and terms or the prayers I pray, the amount of time I read the Bible, all that stuff, that's not the bottom line of my relationship with God. You know, we're all born religious. We come into this world hardwired to think that there must be some secret, some ritual, some hidden key, some spiritual formula, some special food to eat, some some performance to endlessly rehearse, some dogma to memorize, some special doctrines that are better than others, some special conduct, some special unknown knowledge, some special truth, some better creeds to believe, and then God will be pleased with us. Well, that's, of course, that's bad news, because that kind of thinking imprisons us to a lifetime of fear, superstition, guilt, and shame. That's why the gospel is called the gospel. It's good news, not bad news religion. It's good news that Jesus is the end of religion. Here's the kind of message you hear within Christless religion today, and I'm specifically thinking within Christendom. Here's one message. Good news. If you really try to be good, if you really try hard, if you give more, if you do more, if you work harder, then God will love you. <laughs> That's not good news, ladies and gentlemen. Another similar approach goes something like this. Good news. If you show God how sorry you are, if you just keep on begging him to forgive you, and if you keep on showing him and demonstrating to him how sorry you are by the rituals in which you engage over and over again, then maybe God will love you. Hey, that's religion. That's a religious methodology. That's a religious system that attempts to earn God's favor on the basis of human efforts. That's exactly the kind of system outlined in the Old Covenant, the covenant of death. The focus of the Old Covenant is death. But while death is part of the New Covenant, the death of God in the flesh so that death could be overcome, so that religion could be terminated, love is the focus of the New. Apart from the masterful stories we call parables told by Jesus, the Master, the next best Christian storyteller might be a Russian author named Dostoevsky. In his book, The Brothers Karasmov, he tells the legend of the Grand Inquisitor. It's a story about religion meeting Jesus. The story is set about the time of the Inquisitions in Spain, which started about 400 years before Dostoevsky died in 1881. In the story, Jesus returns to earth. He's healing the sick. He's comforting and providing for the poor. Dostoevsky chose the setting of the Spanish Inquisition for Jesus' fictitious second coming because the people of Spain were afflicted and encumbered with oppressive religion, just as much as the Jews were when Jesus first came. The major difference was that the religion that afflicted and enslaved the people of Spain called itself by Jesus' name. It pronounced itself to be Christian. The story of the Grand Inquisitor is a story about the ongoing battle, the war on God's grace by institutionalized big business religion. In the story, and I'm going to have to make this short, Jesus raises a little girl from the dead. The Grand Inquisitor, who is a cardinal, the epitome of religious power and authority, sentences Jesus to death because he's a threat to religion and its power. Jesus is getting in the way of religion. So the Grand Inquisitor goes to visit Jesus in prison, and he tells Jesus that he once believed in Jesus' gospel. But then he saw that, no, people would rather believe religion. He tells Jesus that Jesus is going to have to die because he's getting in the way of religion and its missions and objectives. The Grand Inquisitor, in short, is convinced that if he lets Jesus live, Jesus will put religion out of business. So the Grand Inquisitor informs Jesus that Jesus is going to have to be burned at the stake as a heretic. In the story, Jesus doesn't respond audibly. He just leans forward and kisses this tyrannical, feared religious authority. And the Grand Inquisitor, he is so moved with this visible expression of God's grace that he releases Jesus from the prison, just like you and I have been released from religious prisons by God's grace. Let's pray. Thank you for freedom. Thank you for the end of religion. Thank you for all that you mean to us, your love and your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be with us next week for our message titled, Surprised by Grace. If you want to read the passage ahead of time, you'll want to read Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 
46. Our message next week, Surprised by Grace. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For thine is the